So today we're going to talk about calorimetry. Calorimetry fundamentally deals with thermal energy and how thermal energy changes the temperature of different substances. So we're going to be dealing a lot with heat and the movement of heat and how we quantify it as energy. So in the lab that we did, AC5, we heated water that was in an aluminum can using a fuel and the two fuels that we looked at were ethanol and biodiesel. It's now a good time to think back into physics. When you took physics and you talked about energy, you would always talk about how energy was moving or flowing. In the case of our experimentation, what we noticed was the energy was moving from the candle where it was being produced and then it was being absorbed by the water. So in that case, what we have to understand is that our system, in this case, is the fuel. And the surroundings, for our purposes, is essentially the water in the can. So the movement of, the, of energy, in our case, was from the system outward to the surroundings. And we're just assuming that the water was our surroundings. If you recall, the law of conservation of energy tells us that we can't create or destroy energy. We can just move it around. And in fact, when we move it around, it actually uses usability. And that has a lot to do with entropy, a new word. And also the fact that the energy, when it changes forms, for example, from potential to kinetic or kinetic back to potential, it loses some utility, some usefulness. And that's because a lot of energy gets converted into heat or thermal energy, and we can't always contain that. But the big idea here is that whatever energy that the fuel in the candle produced, we're saying that that's equal to the energy that the water gained inside the can. We can quantify thermal energy symbolically using a capital Q, and we can calculate it if we know a few things. Now, we've talked about other ways to calculate thermal energy using, for example, enthalpies of combustion and amounts of a fuel in moles, but we can also look at the way that a substance temperature changes. And in this equation, Q, which stands for thermal energy, is equal to M, which stands for mass, which is typically in grams, times a new symbol here, the C, that's the specific heat capacity. And you're often going to be dealing with the specific heat capacity of water and water specific heat capacity in blue. I'll write it up here. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity essentially tells us how much energy we have to put in to warm up a gram of that particular substance. So this value of 4.18 tells us that we have to put in 4.18 joules of energy in order for one gram of water to change its temperature by one degree. And of course the final component that's in our equation is this change in temperature. And remember, change in temperature is defined as final minus initial. So, let's take a look at some sample data that we may have obtained in lab today. So let's say I burn some ethanol. We've got an initial mass of fuel and a final mass. And then from there we could figure out how much fuel we actually burned. I'm not going to do it here in this screencast because I know that you can figure that out. But if we go back to our original assumption that the fuel's energy and the water's energy when there's a transfer have to equal one another, what we have to understand is that the fuel loses energy. The water gains energy. Yet those two situations are equal. What I mean by that is whatever energy the fuel loses, that has to be equal to the quantity of energy that the water gains, at least assuming that 100% of the energy gets absorbed by the water. So if we go back to this problem and we look at the data, Essentially, if we want to find Q of water, we should then be able to find, by deduction, we should be able to say, well, that might be equal to however much heat 
that the fuel lost. And we can calculate that using this equation, Q equals MC delta T. Now notice we have to use, for the heat of the water, we have to use data all related to water. So just to show you the setup, and I'm not going to calculate the answer, because I know you can do that. We could say Q, which we don't know, but we have to solve for, equals M. In that case, that's going to be the mass of the water. In our case, that's 149.80 from this piece of the data table times the specific heat, and if you don't remember what that is, we just went over it in the last slide, is a 4.18 joules gram degree Celsius, so I just multiply that by 4.18, times delta T. So to find delta T, I take TF minus TI, so in this case 45 minus 21, so my delta T is 24, and that's what I would multiply all this by. And when I find the product of all of those things, that will give me the amount of thermal energy that the water absorbed. And the label would, of course, be in joules. So you can figure that out on your own. Use this screencast tonight as you work through analyzing questions 1 and 2. And in particular, look carefully at the data table in question 2 and think about how different pieces in this screencast might, be help, you to be, might help you to be successful with it. Good luck. Make sure that if you have questions or can help each other out, use the comments on Schoology to do that.